So a warm welcome from my side. My name is uh, Dr. Katja Lasch. I'm currently heading the German Center for Research and Innovation and also the German Academic Exchange Service. And I'm very glad to welcome the audience who is joining us uh, to our very first Outlook On, I have to say. And the topic of today's Outlook On is Deep Tech Startups and Innovation in India. The German Center for Research and Innovation is a platform for connecting researchers, startups in the field of research and innovation. And with this format Outlook on, we aim to give an insight into yeah, uh, top teams. Uh, um, we give, uh, aim to give a uh, look inside into the Indian research landscape, into the German research landscape. And I'm very glad that we kick off today the session or the, this new format with an insight into deep tech startups in India. India actually hit in the springtime the mark of 100 unicorns. And the startup scene has made it quite into the news, not just in India, but also internationally due to the fact. Uh, startup and innovation has become a trending topic with public awareness, and that just not holds true for India, but also for Germany. The increase in national research and development budgets worldwide, but also the competition for global talent and research and cooperation are indicator for these developments. We are living in a world of economic growth, which is driven by knowledge, and that's why we look up today not at the normal startup on the production sites and look into the deep st start tech startups of India. So we have seen a shift in the economy from the managed economy dominated by large firms to entrepreneurial economy in which small enterprises are developing into main drivers for economic growth. And I see you can see this quite nicely. Uh, last week, actually, Germany published a new startup strategy or the very first startup strategy. Uh, where they highlighted the support of science-based startups and the importance of science-based startups for Germany. And you might know that India has been running for a long time the Startup India initiative, so um, putting a strong focus on these aspects. And if we look in globally, these efforts are mirrored also on the global level. So the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor 21 shows that the number of ecosystems uh, generating nearly 4 billion in ecosystem value, and this has more than doubled over the last four years. So we see a recent increase in this whole startup and uh, startup driven economic. Uh, we also see that uh, diversification. I think it's very important because we have a look into India. As of 2004, 84% of the venture capital went into North America. So there was a strong focus 10, 15 years ago on the North American continent. This number went down to 51% in 2020. 20, and we see now that most of the capital is going to Asia and that Asia is a growing region for startups and for entrepreneurship. India actually has developed over the last three years or over the last years into the third world largest economic startup system. And so it's a time to have a closer look on India. Has India only Google innovations to offer? What is the role of deep tech startups in the whole unicorn story? Where does the investments come? and why India and Germany should cooperate in this field. These are just a couple of questions we will address in today's session. And I would like to invite the audience to post the questions in the chat. We will take them up in the discussion. And I'm very glad to welcome for the discussion uh, Gagan Sabobal, who is uh, working with NASCOM and who is here today to give us an insight into the work of NASCOM and the world of the deep tech startups in India. Gagan Sabobal is the senior director of NASCOM and leads the International Trade Policy Initiative and is head of strategic market initiatives for the industry. He heads the relationship with strategic markets such as Japan, German, and also the French region. And his aim is to create digital cooperation in the field of AI, Internet of Things, Big Data, AI, Robotics, Process Automation in Industry 4.0. He has been instrumental in bringing both Japan and the European Union and India closer by launching various initiatives, for example, the Japan VC Connect initiative. So he is into the field of, of facilitated meeting of Indian startups and business matching sessions that benefit alliances between the large, the small and medium sized enterprises on both sides. He is a strong voice of the industry on matters related to business policy issues, mobility issues, international taxation matters, international and bilateral mutual agreements, and much more. Gagan has been with NASCOM since 2008. And NASCOM, he represents industries views at various business and bilateral forums, and he's sharing his point of views with us today. So Gagan, warm welcome. Greetings from Delhi to Delhi. 
and uh, yeah, yeah I'm looking forward for a fruitful discussion um, today and I would say let's have a look for the beginning at the developments in the Indian ecosystem maybe over the last 10 years with regard to startup. Maybe you can sum it up in a, in a nutshell. So what is your perspective over the last 10 years of the ecosystem in India, where it kicked off and where it has surprisingly reached over the last 10 years? Thank you. Thank you, Pacha, for, uh, for, for that warm welcome. And uh, uh, I also like to welcome all our uh, participants and attendees today. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, when you read out a small brief about me, uh, you know, within NASCOM, we wear different hats. And uh, from our team, which basically looks out of, outside of India, uh, you know, I took on this challenge of bringing the so-called non-English speaking countries closer to, to India. And primarily, you know, uh, two big strategic markets that we've been focusing on for last few years is Japan and Germany. Uh, both these markets have a lot of similarities, I must say. And I personally call Germany as Japan of Europe uh, because, they, because of the similarities, the conservative nature of business, uh, greater degree and emphasis given on the value system, building trust rather than just looking at the bottom lines. So those, you know, sim and demographic, Trends also, you know, in larger part of Europe and Germany, etc. So there are a lot of similarities between Japan and Germany. But more importantly, what caught our eye was uh, that both Germany and Japan are extremely good on the hardware, manufacturing, design, precision engineering kind of things, and India is good on the software kind of, uh, you know, in the in the space. And in our parlance, in the IT world, when you marry the hardware with the software. Uh, that's what you call the IoT or, uh, you know, and, and newer technologies. So we believe uh, that's the broader partnership theme that we carved out. We believe, believe that you are uh, hardware manufacturing kind of uh, businesses partnering with Indian software companies to be able to bring about new range of products and solutions in a co-create mode is what we are chasing. So it's not about outsource the IT to India. Yes, that will happen and will continue to happen because of the power of that India has now become. But I think we are looking at the new age, uh, be, you know, uh, besides us, where we see these mega trends where one is the marriage of hardware with software. So much so that some analysts have started calling that, you know, in next few years, there will be no pure play hardware or software providers because customers are looking for a smart product, uh, whether it's a hardware dominated or software dominated you know who gives a two hoots so that's what the broader theme has been all about and within this broader theme startup has been one uh, thread should i say uh, which has helped us bring together these ecosystems together uh, partnerships at the startup level but before i get into that i think a lot has happened to answer your question katya uh, to a lot has happened in last 10 years in the indian ecosystem uh, I remember, you know, when we launched these 10,000 startup initiatives within NASCOM, it's almost 10 years now, and our endeavor was to see have 10,000 successful startups uh, based out of India or emerging out of India. Today, we have a lot more. Today, we have almost 13,000 startups already. Uh, tech startups, I think non-tech startups included, India will probably have about more than 50,000 in numbers. and. You mentioned about the unicorns. Last year was a record breaking year in some sense. We had 40 unicorns in one year and hundreds of sunicorns. You know, before sunicorns is another terminology. Before you become a unicorn, uh, we call them as sunicorns or scale ups. So we expected that we will hit a number of 100 unicorns by year 2025, but we hit that number in 2022. So that goes on to speak volume. Uh, you know, on how much success can be attributed to this whole new era of startups in India. Uh, I remember, you know, while I was young, uh, not too long ago, uh, I also started a couple of my own startups. Uh, those failed, but uh, I had to take a lot of flack from my own family uh, to actually having gone and ventured into burning my own money or family's money. Uh, for for doing startup, but these days startups is a in thing. 
and you know you were not looked down upon while in my era it was not the case and as you rightly said it's the third largest ecosystem today but let me just quickly articulate with you or to you you know the journey uh, of nascom within the startup ecosystem as i said we started with 10000 startup function and as we gradually moved on we saw the numbers were coming in uh, we were getting a lot of uh, applications but applications that we were getting for uh, were from different kind of startups so some were iot related some were doing ai some were doing data sciences and so on and so forth and then we realized when we opened 11 warehouses across india where we provide the co working space we call them call those warehouses uh, we realized that you know a need for a tech startup uh, was different from an iot based startup because they wanted to work with a lot of measuring instruments and and hardware labs etc uh, which was not the requirement of a typical tech startup and hence we worked things out we started a new initiative which we call a center of excellences uh, with support from government of india and state governments and we have now started launching center of excellences across iot ai data sciences where we try and pool in all the resources that can that are that are basically raw materials or lego blocks for these kind of startups and uh, in last few years we realized that is not run for the mill kind of startup which is gaining traction uh, and we came up with the deep tech club so it was in 2017 actually that we launched our deep tech club within nascom with about 70 startups uh, which was scaled up to almost 180 uh, uh, to in year 2021 and today we are close to about 300 in numbers and our target in next couple of years is to have 500 startups from the deep tech club uh, within nascom what deep tech club has been uh, doing in performing is that you know uh, i think close to about 200 million dollars worth of fund has been raised by these companies which are part of dtc within nascom there's a bifurcation 86 about of 85 of them have been in the seed funding uh, area or or domain uh, seven in series a and beyond two from series b and uh, bulk of them have bootstrapped as well so lot to talk about uh, but i think that gives you a bit of overview uh, you know uh, to answer your question what's been happening in last 10 years or so i think india has come a long long way you know uh, over the last 10 years but yeah speed up or had a huge spike last year the comparison we in germany at the moment have 23 unicorns so i think one can see um, yeah what spike we had in india over the last uh, two um uh, two years and um, i think it's really important that you highlight the role of deep tech startups as india sometimes is seen in germany a bit with frugal innovation and just low cost um uh technology so i think that's really important that you highlight uh highlight at least so if we look a bit at the background of startup founders in Uh, in india we know from germany that 80% of the founders have an academic experience have an academic background in 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 the startups but there's also a very high risk aversion in germany so it's really hard to push people for entrepreneurship for startups if you would look in the indian field how is that how is the background where are these founders especially in deep tech are coming from excellent question uh, tatya must said uh, but uh, deep tech founders the way we've seen a trend is people who have intellectual capital who have experience of having worked with a large organization the obvious names having run their r&d center and so on and so forth and now wish to start something that they could own and curate so that's where we see maximum traction but having said that <clears throat> there are few exceptions as well and there are many exceptions where there are people <clears throat> who may not have that amount of uh, experience or intellectual capital with them but they have passion with them and that passion is driving their passion for solving a particular problem it could be related uh, to a social sector you know they want to bring in a societal change 
uh, help improve mobility, bring down carbon emission, help people in poverty, help with education. So those exceptions are also there. And those have been very successful cases because, you know, I guess at the end of the day, passion is drive is something that drives the businesses. And if you are trying to solve a problem that can help millions and millions of people while allowing you to make money, I guess uh, that's a blessing in disguise. Uh, I guess the biggest problem that India today needs to solve, for example, is that we have almost 500 million people over dependent on agriculture that we don't need. Now, if we can come up with this magic formula of helping these guys and taking up a little more productive job than being over dependent on a small part of farmland, I guess, uh, you know, that person would be treated as God and no, nothing short of God in India, uh, having, having solved that massive problem that government is wanting to solve today. You mentioned uh, agriculture as one of the fields now um, to mention. So if you would have to name two fields in, in the deep tech startups where India has huge potential and which are the upcoming trends. So if I, as a, let's say, German VC or incubator would look into India and would say, yeah, do a bit of scouting. So what should be the two fields uh, in the deep tech startups? Since I should look up, there's a lot of things ongoing and there's a lot of exciting things ongoing for the Indian market. I believe fintech will be topmost priority priority uh reason i say that is not because bulk of unicorns are from the fintech vertical but there are a few mega trends as you see unfolding in the indian ecosystem and these are being driven by government and embraced by the pri private sector and citizens at large uh you know as i was discussing with you just a while ago before we started the program you go to europe you go to parts of Asia, Japan, forget China for a moment. You know, the way we have adopted this UPI regime, which is that all you need is a phone number to be able to transfer money to someone, is giving, is giving you know, goosebumps to some of the, uh, you know, uh, biggies in the industry. And today, credit is not available, you know through UPI. Tomorrow, if credit is also available, then you will see many of the global giants being, you know, uh, running out of business pretty soon. And that's a legitimate fear. But that is the disruption, the level of disruption and transformation that has been brought about by India, by government's intervention. So one UPI regime is one excellent example, just, just one example. And also, you know, government is embracing direct bank transfers for all its subsidies, using Aadhaar as a platform uh, and all of those things. So the amount of amount of transformation disruption that you see in fintech is just phenomenal. Uh, besides that, there are many other verticals, healthcare, because, you know, we are really short of healthcare in this country. Uh, we need disruption in healthcare uh, and agriculture, uh, though it's not a fancy money making field but as i said the problem that currently plagues the agriculture sector if you are able to solve that problem and have a impact on even 10 percent of the population the impact is so profound and big that you can't realize the numbers that we're talking about uh, so it may not be a money making machine but profoundly uh, disruptive in changing human lives uh, Education is another one where there's a lot of scope, a lot of disruption possible. But if it's uh, money making, then yes, fin fintech and mobility, I would say, is where we're seeing a lot of money pour in and a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of VC firms making a lot of money out of those sectors. Thanks for that uh, insight. So before we go a little more into deeper the money questions and so on, maybe let us uh, yeah uh, have a look where the startups are placed in India. So I mean, both of us are sitting in Delhi, but not everybody knows who is a bit of the Bangalore is or Bengaluru is the startup um, uh, city. But besides these two cities, so are there upcoming hotspots at the moment? Do you see a diversification in India, or is there a focus? Is there a focus on, let's say, four or five big cities, or should I, who would like to look into India, look also at second, third tier cities? Is there scope for, yeah, for diving into the deep stake startup scenes there? 
Uh, I think what last two years have taught us is that, you know, you could be actually sitting in your home, bedroom, drawing room, living room, garage, and still be able to do business. So uh, if you really ask me that question, uh, uh, that was a question before COVID. Uh, now people have started coming back to office uh, to a greater degree, uh, and mostly in startups because it's a small team and you need to, how do you develop a, uh, you know, a organizational culture and a value system within a small team, unless only five of you or 10 of you are working together. So you are right, uh, Bangalore, Mumbai, if you happen to be a fintech, Pune, if you happen to be in the automotive vertical, um, and like in case of Berlin, where you are, uh, in, in case of Germany, where you identified, okay, uh, logistics will be Frankfurt and Berlin will be f f fintech. Uh, we are not that organized. Uh, uh, we are not that organized and we see all types and kinds of companies come up in all these major cities. So. I think innovation is also happening in tier two towns now, especially during and after COVID. Uh, but yes, the the ecosystem that you get in a in a Delhi or a Bangalore or a Mumbai uh, is is quite phenomenal and helps you grow grow much faster. So while tier two time towns are will continue to pick up, but uh, I reckon. But there are few. I must mention there are few startups. Uh, that are doing phenomenal disruption. A case in point would be somebody offering lines of credit to uh, not so privileged class people. So for them, the audience base happens to be living in villages in 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 Bihar, in northeast, and so so far away. Those entrepreneurs may be based out of Delhi or uh, whatever Kolkata, but for all their money, you know bulk of their operations happens at the village level. So I don't know whether you call them a startup based out of Calcutta or a startup based in Bihar, where they have maximum number of uh, consumers for their, their, their solution. So uh, it's very disruptive, you know, very disruptive because in a startup environment, you may have four people working from Mumbai and four people working in Delhi. So I don't know whether you call them a Mumbai or a Delhi based startup. Yeah, I think that's also a specific uh... I think for India, I have to say, in my experience here is the mobility of people is tremendous and people don't have an issue flying once, twice, thrice a week. Uh, so this, uh, I think it comes along with the mobility, which we, we've seen in India over the last decades, uh, which is, as I said, uh, people are flexible and, and mobile. You mentioned venture capital, we mentioned finance. So if you want to start your startup, maybe we, we have a look a bit on the financial structures of the startup landscape. In, in India and Germany. So if you would compare and let's maybe have first a look at early seed, the early seed phase or the incubation early seed phase, how would you weigh the implication of the government fundings and the uh, venture capitalists? So what role does government play, funding plays in the deep tech startups uh, in the early seed phase? And what role does the venture uh, capital money play? So the private money from businesses? Sure, sure. So <clears throat> you're right. and. Uh... Having traveled across the world, uh, seen the German ecosystem, the French ecosystem, Japanese, Chinese ecosystem, uh, I guess <clears throat> that the way we see this trend unfold is that the early age, the seed funding round in most of the developed economies is actually funded by the government. When I was in Germany, I saw and, and you know most of the startups uh, were actually funded by the clusters that they were part of. And same thing has been seen in other geographies. I guess that trend is picking up in India as well. Now you see more organized funding by the state itself, whether it's from the center, whether it's from the state governments or from the municipal governments. But now we are seeing more organized form of uh, seed funding coming together for early age startups, which are in ideation stage and many state governments are launching their own program, which I think is a very healthy trend. Uh, most of the venture capital firms, uh, P firms come a little later, but most of the venture capital VC firms and the CVC firms, uh, we believe are happy looking at a sweet spot. Uh, the smallest ticket size I would believe will be between 2 million to 5 million funding round. Uh, that's where the, the VC money or the CVC money comes in. Uh, 
and then you have some big ticket writers that come in uh, in the form of CVC or a private equity firm at a much later stage. So I think we released a report just recently. Uh, and if you look at some of the numbers that are coming in from that report is that we're talking about almost six, seven billion dollars of funding coming into Indian startup scene every quarter. And 75% uh, of that money is actually uh, coming into growth stage and beyond or late stage. So it's the VC money or the private money is only coming to the extent of about 15% uh, in the early age startups. The size or the ticket size also matters. So we've seen that almost, uh, 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 you know, 50 to $100 million worth of ticket size, which is 70% of the fund, you know, the, the bigger, bigger ticket purchases is, 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 is uh, uh, accounting for that funding that is coming in. So uh, I think that's why I said public sector, state, center, whatever, uh, coming in to support early age startups is a, is a very healthy trend in India. And I think it will only pick up. Uh, however, I must mention that, you know, we played our part in, in, in some of, uh, you know, these things. Uh, Japan, for ex example, where I've worked a lot, is extremely keen, extremely keen to be able to invest into Indian startups. Some of the reasons for them is that because they do not have a startup culture of their own, there are hardly any startups that you see from Japan. Uh, and also because they look at India as a very big market. So if they want to purchase businesses while it's cheaper to purchase businesses before they become successful in India. And hence they've been making a lot of bigger bets and smaller bets in India. And with support from both the governments, we were able to articulate uh, the need for funds of fund, which was launched, uh, I think in 2020, uh, the total seed capital uh, today, as it stands, is about $180 million committed capital. And this money, uh, we have a fund manager as well, which is uh, Nippon Reliance, which is managing this fund. And they invest in Indian VC firms, not giving or writing checks to individual companies, but the venture capitalist firms that in that in turn invest in the startup uh, of a particular vertical or particular size uh, in India. So that's how we've seen you know some of these trends unfold. Yeah, I think it's a bit the same structure in Germany we've seen in the early stage massive influx of uh, funding from the government up to 43 percent. A lot of programs run by the German government that the exist funding scheme. But even funding scheme for incubators, not to set up incubators. I think that's what we've seen in India too over the last years that there was a really investment of the government to set up incubators and to yeah, bring them on the run in a in a way. And uh, you mentioned the massive increase in venture capital in India. Same holds true for Germany. Actually, we had a jump in 70 percent compared from 20 to 21. Now, you mentioned Japan as a major investor, so let me challenge you a bit here. So, I mean, we know that India is running the scheme of self-reliant India. And uh, so if we have a look from where the VC funding is coming, is it from inside of India? Um, because in Germany, there is a concern. A lot of the venture capital is coming from the US, actually, from abroad. And it's a huge concern in Germany. So how is that seen in India and how is the setup? In India, as there has always been a strong focus in Indian economy to be self-reliant, to, yeah, to bring it up from the own resources, which is traditional in the Indian economics, not just over the last 10 years also, uh, yeah, I'd say since, since independence, actually. Good point, good point that you raise over there. Uh, but I would, uh, if I could answer that candidly, I think at the moment for Indian startups, the color of money doesn't matter till the time it is not coming from our very close neighborhood. We have few exceptions to that rule. Um, uh, so, uh, but beyond that, as it's happening in Germany or elsewhere, uh, you know, if you look at how the capital markets are structured and I've been in my past life playing in capital markets as well, a lot of money that word owns sits in the US or gets printed in the US. So it's only, you know, inevitable, inevitable that, you know, the money will again flow back to emerging economies, developing economies, developing sectors back from the US. So yes, you are right. The bulk of money still can be colored as the American money, but we see uh, bigger bits now coming from Asia, 
specifically from Japan, Singapore. But again, how this money travels is very complex. You know, sometimes you know uh, uh, a, an American VC firm may route a money through a Mauritius-based company, and those things happen. So I don't know. Uh, I was looking at the numbers. I think Mauritius turned out to be the biggest investor in India because of the tax treaty that we have with them. So it's difficult to color uh, or put a finger on you know where the money is coming from. Obviously, uh, US is one. But some of the some of the companies <clears throat> through our effort who have received money from the Japanese investors, particularly, like them, and I'll tell you why. Because they say that the Japanese investors are not too, uh, you know, itchy and not always standing over your shoulder asking you about the numbers this month or past month or the next month. Uh, so they don't. They're not those you know nitpickers, and and they will allow you to do your business. Uh, but keep a close eye on you, but not get into the business. But sometimes that's not true for some of the other uh, more uh, aggressive investors, as 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 you know they they called us. So, but I guess if I were to generalize my statement in India today, I don't think startups will worry you know a lot. What's the color of the money that that is coming in from? There are few exceptions to that rule. Good. So um. Let us take it a step further. So once the startup is mature, and, and I had a discussion this, uh, this week with an industrial representative of a German company who visited here in Delhi, and then we were discussing about startups, buy in, buy out, opt in, all these possibilities. And then, I mean, I know from the German system that uh, there is a very early exit. So we have seen no IPO, no initial public offer in, in 2020 in Germany. So no, no, no startup went to the DAX index and uh, to the stock exchange. And I was wondering how does that look in India? Does is it the funding uh, culture which we see in the US, especially at the Bay Area? Found your startup, then you sell it, and then you make money. Or do Indian startup founders tend to bring the startup to a close and then also maybe seek to go for for IPO? Um, I guess there are all sort of people all across the world. Uh, you will see, uh, you know, this trend. Across the world, uh, I guess I have no basis of what I'm saying right now. But most of the young entrepreneurs, even old as well, in most of the cases, so bulk of them will be in the game for making a quick buck. You know, let's start a company, take it to a certain level, raise the market capitalization, and sell it off, and make money, and then start a new venture, because. Typically in India, country like India, there's no dearth of ideas, no dearth of problem that you can solve. Maybe in Germany, you you may have problem, but or you know, I I, I wonder, you know, people in Japan have been living with Shinkansen for last 60 years, so you know the older generation had the bullet train while they were young. So I don't know what problem the new generation will solve because there hardly any problems over there. But in India, you know, look around. And the problems everywhere to solve. So till that time remains, and I think it will remain for a very long time, uh, at least in my generation, uh, there will be there will be no dearth of problems to solve. It. There will be no dearth of ideas, and the people will will have a lot of uh, uh, money to make. But I I guess it's you're right. Uh, majority of them I see are in that business in business of making quick buck. While you talk to them, they will all say no 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 no. But we want to go IPO etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, Somewhere down below, you you get that feeling, you know. Okay, I hear you, what you're saying. Uh, but there are exceptions. There are few people who believe in what they're doing, and they want to be there in that game for a very long period of time. Not because they wish to make a lot of money, but maybe because they are passionate about the problem that they're solving, about the company that they started, or the uh, you know uh, people that get associated with that idea. Over a period of time, but I guess that's that's everywhere. That's everywhere. More in US because you have more. You see more transactional nature of business over there. Uh, more in China because I've seen China very closely, and and you know I was interacting with one group of young entrepreneurs in one cluster, and they said that you know in India you have many gods, but in China we don't have any gods. So our only god is money. So what's wrong in making a quick buck, starting a company, selling a company? And I couldn't argue with that. 
Good, thanks for that. In, in the, I think it's a very interesting question and to follow up and to look at some some data because that be also a bit of a cultural cultural thing uh, um, be uh, behind. I would like to invite our audience also to put questions in the chat. I think I have one here. Maybe we can put that in between. There's the questions if chemical uh, comes under deep tech startups. So what would you be your take on it? So the startup in the specialty of chemical comes under the deep tech startups. Sorry, I didn't get the question, Katja. Are startups working in chemicals uh, uh -huh. belonging to deep tech startups or would it be more on the production manufacturing side? Oh, uh, difficult for me to say. Depends on uh, whether you're actually leveraging technology to be able to solve a particular problem or not. I, I don't think it's related with any sector. It could be uh, water treatment, sewage treatment. Uh, and you could still be a deep tech startup, but totally depends on whether you're leveraging technology uh, uh, and you know AI layer, drawing a lot of data sets, drawing conclusions, and 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 then letting the algorithm uh, predict the future or predict the future trends for you. Uh, that's what, in my book, you know, qualifies to be a deep tech startup, irrespective of whether you are from an automotive vertical or a chemical vertical or a, uh, you know whatever process manufacturing. I think that's, that's the right answer. So there is no vertical, there is more the, the approach and the technology behind, and this thing can, could come from different technology fields. So we're not just talking about AI or uh, IoT. It could be in life sciences, a lot of pharmaceutical developments, and and um, and so on. So uh, Gagan, you mentioned NASCOM, so it's a big association, um, software and service companies, big sector in in India. Uh, who su supports and you mentioned already the program where you're supporting venture capital uh, 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 firms. But uh, so as NASCOM, are you looking at the moment at the particular field or is it more a general approach to connect uh, startups to, to help them out? Or would you say we looking at the moment on a specific topic which we try to build up in the whole ecosystem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for asking me that, uh, asking me that question. As you would imagine, in India, we need all sorts of jobs. It's not only that, you know, deep tech jobs will be the darling and rest is uh, expendable. No, uh, in India, we need all sorts of jobs. So it's not as if one set of type of companies or startups will be dear to us and not the other ones. So hence, as I said, uh, uh, during the initial part of my, uh, uh, you know, rejoinders, we have also learned and diversified within NASCOM. So if you're a tech startup, then you should be placed with NAS NASCOM 10,000 startup initiative because that's where we can take care of you better. If you are something to do with, uh, you know, automotive, a lot of sensors, machine sensors, and stuff like that, or predictive maintenance, then center of excellence on IoT will be the right bucket where we can place you. If you happen to be working only with deep tech, then deep tech club will be the right club. But it's not as if the deep tech club is the elitist club uh, and rest is not. Uh, we've created this diversification because we understand that all companies need different and different types of support. And hence, we've created these, uh, this diversification within NASCOM. But uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, what an individual entrepreneur is looking forward to is that if I get into your ecosystem, how does it help me? I have started my own startups. I've worked with many startups. You know, if I were to categorize all startup entrepreneurs have maximum four kinds of requests. One is people will come back to you and say, can you help me connect with investors? Second is, can you help me get connected with customers? When I say customers, it could be enterprises, co-create with smaller company, with larger company, what have you. Third and fourth are not that critical. There are a few scale-ups who say that, you know, I wish to set up an office in Singapore or US. Can you help me over there? Then yes, we can help you over there. And there are other, uh, you know, the ecosystem, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, people who derive benefits from the ecosystem that you've created, the mentorship, legal help, marketing help, uh, and all of that stuff. But I guess at the end of the day, primarily, uh, the two critical aspects is can you help me get customer or an investor? Those are the critical ask for at least for Indian startups. Uh, not so much for the developed country startup, like let's say in Germany, they also have the similar uh, problems. 
but because of the good funding support from the government they still have a good runway uh, uh, you know and they're not fighting for survival in next 3 months 6 months so they normally i've seen they have a better runway than indian companies or in their counterparts so what we've done is in select few geographies where we have government support we started this in initiative of creating as i said the uh, and you also read out the japan vc connect program we started with japan because the americans already know indian lay off land a lot of money is coming in uh, and we have good connections with with uh, with with america but in case of japan they needed they like to come to india they didn't know where to start and we created that platform for them so today we have uh, a platform uh, where we have vc cvc and private equity firms part of this platform we have a close to about 200 investors on our platform from japan uh, we have about 150 from singapore we have about 75 from south korea about 150 from european union all europe at the moment so we created this platform where we can do live pitching session whether in person or during covid time virtually which were happening uh, so that we help indian companies part of our portfolio and show them around to the investor community and that's one exercise that we've been running for last 3 years almost now and now <clears throat> we've stopped doing virtual session because we are now getting into the in person more than i think we'll be announcing a program for for japan and and singapore and maybe europe uh, very soon within this year october november time frame and similarly we also are helping indian startups get connected with the enterprises so whether it's robert bosch or whether it's siemens or whether it's uh, hitachi or sony or honda or toyota so we create those programs where these indian startups can make a pitch to the enterprises as well and some of them may work with them in a co-create mode or they may wish to buy buy them out whatever is like but i think as a facilitator enabler of the secret system our job is to help them connect with as many enterprises or investors as possible and hence we develop those those platforms that are spoken about it's explored in silence so you connect them on the business business side but they are also part of the game of the let's say research institutions on on the other side i think and players as as we as the dbh come into the game as we connect it to research and i think it's a good good well fit a setup in the in the in the system so the business side and then Uh, about the technology side and the, the research side, and thanks for highlighting the importance of this international outlook and cooperation in the whole field, which broadens your uh, broadens your um, horizons. I think that brings us a bit uh, that brings us a bit to internationalization, and I mean we know that startups look at the local markets, so no, that's what they normally do. Uh, but I read in the new startup strategy of Germany, the fostering networking and international cooperation is one of the aims. And I was glad to see that more information for international startups towards Germany is one of the goals, but also connecting with developing countries. So I think India will be a major player in in that uh, in that game. So from your experience, because you connect them and it's about cash flow, what is this international experience bringing to startups and add on? Even if they might not look for market entrance, but should one connect them in an early stage internationally? Should one not do? Should they focus on the local market? Uh, so. Uh, What would be your take on yeah this international international outlook? I reckon uh, the answer lies somewhere in between. There are few companies and the model that they have devised. Uh, we've showcased many of them through our platform. Uh, their 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 model or their their uh, problem solving technique is actually focused on let's say developed market regime. So they'll be better off. in us and they are better off in us or in europe uh, to begin with and they don't see india as their market however we also see many startups wanting to solve a societal problem here in india so for them internationalization will mean maybe looking in sark countries parts of asia parts of africa so every every organization will have their different international internationalization strategy uh, some of these uh some of these uh, uh companies that are having this profound impact on society are happy taking money from uh outside so uh, we've seen that in many a cases where 
many firms from Europe, from Asia, uh, want to be associated with these types and kinds of companies. So it's a, I wouldn't generalize and say that everybody should at least delve into interna internationalization. Some probably don't need it at all uh, because India in itself is a big market, you know, big enough market for anyone to, to test and, 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 and create a robust uh, growth strategy. And many of those fintech firms are just focusing their efforts on India because it's a huge market for them. Um, don't do it for the heck of it. Uh, you should have a business plan on why you are approaching international markets, if at all, whether to raise capital or whether to look for customers or whether to maybe acquire new technology in the same domain or partner with someone. So I would say that having said that, partnering with within the startup to startup is easier said and done on a paper than on ground. I have not seen a successful case study for that personally. We've tried it, but we failed and we learned it from it that, you know, it's difficult to do that. But what we are now approaching is that, for example, we were, we, have, we looked at University of Tokyo, University of Hiroshima. They have a lot of patents lying with them, ideally. Uh, they have done research, but they have no takers who will take this research or a patent and commercialize this and take it to the world. So they have, we've seen that in, in probably Europe as well, where you do not have that robust startup ecosystem that you, your research institutes and universities are churning out new inventions, but nobody's taking them to the commercialization phase. So we are now looking at that model. Can we tie up with, let's say, University of Hiroshima and come up with a model where Indian startup companies get exposed to those patents? If they use that patent and create a commercial product, then some part of the revenue goes back to university to fund you know, further research or whatever. Uh, so. I think that's probably a better idea. Uh, but again, coming back to your question, don't do for the heck of it. L figure out whether you're wanting to raise money, customer, or IP cooperation. Yeah, I think I can second it as we're also active in the field. So we've been yeah, trying and then I think that connecting incubator to incubator that works quite well. We know from Germany that exact same thing, technology is laying there, patents which are not used and there is a seek for somebody to implement that, to, to take that technology. But one could also see, I mean, internationalization could also mean technologies in Germany and one uses it in, in, in a startup in India or vice versa. I have here a question actually related to this. So there was a question about logistics and consulting and warehousing. Um, first question would be, is this an upcoming trend in India? Can one say this? And the second question actually was exactly, how can we take advantage of this trend from Germany? Would it be possible to found a startup in India and then provide support and the methodology and the technology from Germany? So what would you be your suggestion in that case or go for a poor Indian startup? So I see two parts to this question. Yes. So first part question, logistics consulting, warehouse consulting. I don't know about consulting, but you know, we are swamped with requirements, at least from the Japanese audiences um, on the mobility aspects where they wish to solve a lot of logistics problem. I would, I, I'm not at the liberty of naming the company, uh, but it's a huge empire and they are in business of moving a very premium car across the world and they're looking for logistics solutions and they're happy to work with nimble footed starters. So, Mobility is the space. Consulting, I honestly don't know because most of these, at least most of the Japanese friends that I have are looking at, at least have a framework. If not a product ready, at least have a framework that they can tweak and you know make it work. Uh, consulting, sorry, I can't say much because I, I'm not from that field uh, personally. Uh, but uh, working with Germany, uh, that is plausible and possible. Uh, there's a startup named with uh, Get My Park In, and they are based out of India. They are doing wonders in case of Germany. They work with Mercedes and Daimler, and 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 you know in the in the parking space, and their solution is working across Germany and parts other parts of Europe. So yes, that is possible, and and you know we've seen some of those companies emerge from our portfolio through our support as well, and we are proud to be associated in their in their journey. So. Yes, it's possible, but again, you know, if when you develop a product, uh, 
a lot of Japanese startups came to India and failed because the reason was your major assumptions go wrong when you build a product in Japan and launch the product in India. Because you've been living your life on 4G, you know, in, in India, in some places, you don't get 4G. You still go back to 2G in some cases. So uh, you, if you're working with those assumptions, your product will fail in India. Or if you're working with different price points of Japan or Germany or in India. So if you're developing a product for Germany, then my recommendation would be that please reach out to uh, people like Katya and us so that we can we can introduce you to with an incubator over there so that you are better off at least having, if not the entire team, but part of team based over there while you build a product for Germany or for Europe. Otherwise, you can go profoundly wrong. Uh, that is definitely advice. I, mean, I think there are different models of cooperation, I have to say. What we have seen is that uh, Germans who came to India, had a business idea, went back to Germany, founded their startup. We've seen Indian students traveling to Germany founding their startup now and reaching out now with the product and uh, adapting it for the Indian markets to carry it back. Uh, we have also seen a startup founder in Germany who looked out for a partner in India and they took the technology further together. So I think there are different models and it's not just this market access and expense. So I think there's a lot of things one can do. One has to be uh, careful and it's always to be advised to work in international teams in that case. Uh, so that's one has to look into what's happening in India and in in um, uh, Germany. So this, this would be, I think, a bit of advice to look at the different models which one can do. And it's not just this, uh, I found my startup or, and I go to Germany for market access. So there's a lot of in between and before one we ever can do them. And us comment ourselves would be of of help to connect and to yeah um, bring hopefully good product products to India and also to Germany. I think there's a lot of scope in co-creating and cooperation together. Um, there is one question here, um, if the German companies are open for technology transfer and business models and what are the markets Germany is interested in collaborating, co-creating with India? I think that's a very, very interesting question. I have uh, to see maybe from your experience, where did you see a good fit in between India and Germany and in which technology fields? Uh, <clears throat> Well, in many sectors, and I think large companies are already doing it because they have luxury of doing it. So you look at Siemens, you look at Bosch, you look at SAP uh, from Germany. All of them are leveraging both HQ as well as India to create new range of products. And 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 I was you know with uh, I was speaking at a seminar with uh, Mercedes MD India, and he gave a very nice anecdotal evidence. He said that not many people across the world know that there's a bit of India element in every Mercedes car that you see across the world. Whether that model is available in India or not doesn't matter because some part of that car was designed out of the India factory. So most of the large companies, I think, are already doing it. They Many of them are running their own incubators, um, Airbus and, and, and Bosch and, and Siemens. They work with startups in their domain. Um, so if you're not if you are in that domain, then I would suggest that you, sh you should please look up and most definitely reach out to them if you are in the in, in that domain. Uh, so I guess the answer to your question is yes. But as I, both me and Katya were ex you know, just exchanging notes on my last trip to Germany a month ago, there are 70% of the German GDP is the German metal stamp. But we all know of Siemens and SAP and obvious names. But 70% of the GDP is attributed to the German metro standard. And German metro standard is very conservative in nature. But that doesn't mean that they're not big on technology, innovation, or revenues. Uh, but to be able to build that trust, we are trying, you know, from our side to be able to create, uh, create that bridge where, you know, uh, we can give them that confidence that you can work with an Indian outfit, even remotely. We are trying our bit to be able to create that super highway through which the partnerships can can flow. But I don't think NASCOM alone can move the mountain inch by inch. We will need support from uh, you know all stakeholders from Germany, from India, government and otherwise to be able to accomplish that. Uh, but I guess Germany, the feeling that I got was now wants to de-risk itself or defocus itself from China. And when they do that, India is the obvious location 
that comes at the very top. So I don't know whether Katya, you're also getting that same feeling or not, but that's what I picked up in a lot of cities in Germany. I think it's a matter of readjusting at the moment in Europe with the situation we are facing in Europe, China, but also the, the difficult situation with Russia. So everybody is readjusting at the moment and then India becomes an obvious choice. But I would like to add, one should not forget that we see also an increase in investments of Indian companies in Germany. So it's not just the, always the one side we heard um, to see. And I think it could be also a good point uh, for our German audience here to touch base to see what are Indian companies uh, in, uh, who are yeah, investing in Germany. And we see an increase in that um, up to, and that could also be a good connect uh, to connect maybe back to India or to, to, to connect with them uh, on, the, on the ground. I think that leads us slowly to one hour. Wow, that went really, really fast. <laughs> uh, I think that leads us uh, to the end of our session in a, in a way. So, um, Gagan, if you would have one tip for an Indian startup, uh, what they should do and what they should look at in Germany, what would you say? Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, but I would reckon that in case you happen to be a startup uh, from the manufacturing domain and if you're doing anything which is remotely associated with industry 4.0 framework which is basically managing your shop floor your machines where all those predictive maintenance etc come through then please reach out to me at least because we know of many german companies who are looking to work with indian startups uh, in the similar domain because there are a lot of manufacturing, small manufacturing companies in Germany who need this support and are currently struggling, currently struggling to be able to find resources to be able to accomplish what they wish to do. So in, in case you happen to be a startup, even if remotely associated with manufacturing sector or solving any man manufacturing related problem, then please do reach out to me. And you have great scope in Germany. That's what I've seen uh, when I roam around over there. Let me add on India, maybe, so we play the game a bit in a different direction. I would say, don't forget that in India, you can do a lot of things in English language. That's what I always tell people. It's good, accessible also in the smaller cities. And don't forget that India is not just about frugal innovation. There's a lot of things ongoing. And uh, yeah, touch base with uh, the, the incubators, for instance, or with uh, NASCOM to see what's ongoing. and. Uh, not just think that India is a developing country and it's quite developed in a lot of fields. And uh, we just mentioned fintech and architect. I think these are really upcoming fields where India has a lot to offer. So look at look at from a really open point of view, I would say, and then try to connect and uh, go away with, away with your Indian cliches once you have in your mind if you're sitting in, in Germany. So, Gaga, thanks so much for this uh, wonderful session. I think Thank we, you. Still, we stay Thank connected. You couple of ideas yeah. has been floated. I would like to mention that the DV has currently running a tandem project for startups. We have uh, six startups from Germany on the ground in India, partnered them up with Indian startups and they try to experience exchange opinions. It's a pilot for us. We are running this at the moment in Campo and then uh, in Bangalore. But I also would like to highlight to our audience um, that we offer you a unique opportunity at the 16th of September to have a look what's ongoing in research and startups in the Indian uh, Indian in India. So we will run the following walls lab and then event innovators connect, pitch and match. You see here the registration link. Uh, what is in for you? We will provide speed workshops uh, on ideation, but also on storytelling for startups and researchers. But there's also the unique opportunity to watch 15 finalists, which we selected from all over India, who will pitch their idea in different fields. Uh, so I think it's a good taste for our German audience here to get a feeling of what's ongoing in India. As I said, these finalists you see here have been selected and will present in three minutes their breakthrough idea, be it from research or in the startup field. You can find them on our website and would like to invite you to this event. So thanks, Gagan, for this wonderful discussion again. I think we stay connected and hopefully meet also live for a cup of coffee in the next upcoming days here in, in Delhi. Thanks to the audience. Thanks to the question for the uh, yeah, great questions uh, and for the discussion. I hope we stay also connected with the audience and see you here and there, be it digital, be it on our on-site events, which we are running in the field of entrepreneurship and startups. I wish you yeah, a good afternoon for our Indian audience, for our German audience, a good day ahead as it's earlier in the day. Take care and see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Katrin.